Well, welcome to another edition of Monocle and Spade, the podcast of epic archaeology, where we explore the world of the Bible and beyond through the lens of history and archaeology. And I want to welcome you today to our podcast. And those of you uh, who have been watching and giving comments, thank you so much. Um, I am very excited today to have uh, a really special guest with us, and I'll introduce him in just a second. Uh, but let me say a couple of words. Uh, today is our special Advent edition of Monocle and Spade, where we're going to focus primarily on the mystery of the incarnation, the fact that God became man in the person of Christ. And we have a very special guest to discuss that today. And, and he and I both are going to be talking about uh, another guy that you all know. We'll talk about him in a moment. That's C.S. Lewis. Uh, but a couple of comments. Thank you so much for your encouraging words, those of you who sent emails. And um, I got a couple of comments. And let me just say this, that a couple of folks have said, you know, you, Ted, you call the podcast Monocle and Spade. So you should have a monocle on. So just to let you know, guys know, I have heard you. and I'm going to, I'm in the process now of getting a monocle. I've actually found one online. So in the next podcast for Epic Archaeology, uh, Monocle and Spade, I'm going to actually have a monocle on. And, and, and the one that I found actually is a real monocle. So I will have that. Uh, for those of you who've been asking for that, uh, I think it's a good idea. I think we should bring that the monocle back. It's pretty cool. So uh, anyway, without further ado, uh, today's podcast uh, is a special Advent edition. Of course, Advent being the Christmas season, uh, the fact that Christians around the world in the church calendar, the liturgical calendar, celebrate the birth of Christ, the incarnation of the Son of God, and we're going to talk about that. And today, I've got a spe very special guest with me today. Uh, Dr. David Downing is the co-director with his lovely wife, Crystal Downing, of the Marion E. Wade Center at Wheaton College here in Wheaton, Illinois. And uh, David grew up in Colorado. He graduated from Westmont College and earned his PhD from UCLA. Um, Dr. Downing has written four scholarly books on C.S. Lewis. Uh, Planets in Peril, written in 1992, which is a critical study of the Ransom Trilogy, truly amazing uh, trilogy by Lewis. Um, he also wrote another book called The Most Reluctant Convert in 2002, which examines Lewis's journey uh, to faith. And then in 2005, uh, Dr. Downing wrote Into the Wardrobe, uh, which is an in-depth overview of the Narnia Chronicles, uh, which is a, a favorite of many people. We're going to actually talk about that today. And then, uh, and then in 2005, he also wrote Into the Region of Awe, which is a study of how Lewis's wide reading in Christian mysticism enhanced his own faith and enriched his imaginative writing. Um, they, uh, Dr. Downing has also provided a critical introduction and over 400 explanatory notes uh, to the new edition of C.S. Lewis's The Pilgrim's Regress, originally published in 1933, and then reissued by Erdman's uh, at the Wade Center, annotated edition in 2014. Uh, Dr. Downing is also a consulting reader on C.S. Lewis for publications of the Modern Languages Association, as well as Christian Scholars Re Review, can't speak, and wow. Religion and Literature. He also serves as editorial consultant for Blackwell's Books, Cambridge University Press, Notre Dame University Press, and several other academic uh, publications, uh, or publishers, rather. Uh, Dr. Downing is also the author of Looking for the King, uh, written in 2010, which is a historical novel in which two young Americans uh, meet Lewis and Tolkien in Oxford in 1940, and uh, I've been reading that lately, and it is just fantastic. I just love that book, uh, so please uh, check that out. You can get it on Amazon. Uh, you can also find Dr. Downing's blog uh, at cslewis.com. So uh, first of all, let me just welcome you, David, so much uh, for coming on. Thank you for coming on the program, Monocle and Spade. Yeah, thanks, Ted. I'm happy to join you. It's, it's a uh, great idea to have a podcast about biblical archaeology. So uh, I'm uh, really glad that I could join you today. Thank you so much. And, and let me just say that um, uh, it's well, the, one of the great things about living here in Wheaton is that you get to visit the Wade Center. And for those of you who are not aware of that, I know that they're, I know it's, it's shocking to some people, David, but some people don't know what the Wade Center is. Uh -huh. And uh, so uh, could you explain what, uh, who Marion Wade is and what the Wade Center, just kind of in a brief way, uh, so that people will know what the Marion Wade Center is? Sure. Uh, the Marion Wade Center was uh, started in 1965, a professor of English at Wheaton College named Clyde S. Kilby realized that Lewis and Tolkien were going to be uh, important authors well into the next century, as they turned out to have been. So he started collecting C.S. Lewis materials and Tolkien materials. Eventually, he decided there were seven British Christians 
most of them are either friends of C.S. Lewis or influences on Lewis. Uh, and so that collection grew and grew through the 60s, through the rest of the 20th century. And then in 2001, we had a separate building. Uh, Marion E. Wade is, uh, a, was an important Christian businessman. He started Service Master. And his daughter uh, gave us the building, the Marion E. Wade Center, in honor of her father. So it's a collection of basically all the primary materials on Lewis, Tolkien, Dorothy Sayers, George MacDonald, G.K. Chesterton, Charles Williams, and uh, Owen Barfield, plus all the secondary works, all the dissertations. You can wow. come into the building and do a dissertation on one of our authors without ever going online. So I'm hoping that uh, some Amish person will come in and do a dissertation <laughs> with that, no technology. All, all the books and periodicals are right there in the building. That is fantastic. So it's literally a Lewis Tolkien, uh, Dorothy Sayers archive. It's, it's a literal archive of their works. Right. It's both an archive. We also have a museum space. We have uh, the wardrobe, which was in Lewis's home when he was growing up. Children love to see that. Love it. Uh, he and his brother used to climb inside of it when they were children and tell each other stories. So he associated wardrobes with imagination. We also have Tolkien's desk. Uh, we have pipes from various authors. We have Dorothy Sayers glasses. So it's a lot of fun to visit, not only for research reasons, but just to uh, wander into the world of imagination by these great Christian authors. Absolutely. And if you are ever in the Chicago area of folks that are watching who are not from Chicago, you've definitely got to make a trip to Wheaton College campus and go to the Marion Wade Center. I've been there several times. I've brought my mom there. Um, and uh, if, you, if you're not careful, David, it, you might actually slip into Narnia if you go into the wardrobe, right? That's right. That's right. <laughs> Well, there's so many things that we can talk about, and, and I know that our time is going to fly uh, about this particular episode, uh, but, but again, this is our special Advent edition, but of course, C.S. Lewis is always relevant year-round, so the things we talk about uh, are not relevant only for Christmas, uh, but, but they're relevant for, for all of history and all of time. So our focus uh, today is primarily going to be uh, Christ uh, and C.S. Lewis, and specifically the miracle, the mystery and the historical reality of the incarnation, the fact that, that God, the creator of the universe, came down into human flesh through the Virgin Mary and was born into the world, and that this event is the central hub around which all of history turns. Uh, to quote Dorothy Sayers, and David, your wife is a, is a scholar, uh, one of the top scholars in the world in Dorothy Sayers, but she wrote in her book, The Man Born to be King, she says that Jesus Christ is unique unique among gods and men, that there have been incarnate gods of plenty and slain and resurrected gods, not a few, but he, that is Jesus, is the only God who has a date in history. And uh, so we're not just talking about some, some uh, esoteric sort of belief that, that we actually believe that God came down into time and inner time uh, through the person of Christ. And uh, a moment ago, I was mentioning to you uh, before we began recording this really remarkable book, a uh, little booklet that you can actually purchase uh, from the Mar Marion Wade Center. I believe you can also get it on ChristianHistory.com. It's called The Grand Miracle, and uh, it is uh, Daily Reflections on the Season of Advent, and it is a fantastic book. So folks can go to the Marion Wade Center and have that uh, uh, mailed to them, or if you're in the Chicago area, you can go pick one up yourself. I believe, and David, correct me if I'm wrong, you can get this on ChristianHistory.com as well, right? Right. Right, yes. And there's a quote here in, in the book. It's a quote from Lewis's Miracles in which he says, the central miracle asserted by Christians is the incarnation. They say that God became man. Every other miracle prepares for this or exhibits this or results from this. Mm -hmm. so, so this is a, do you have any comments on that and, and how Lewis, this is something that he personally sort of, he had to come to terms with uh, as an atheist because he started out as an atheist. Right, right. Uh, well, he was born in Belfast in Northern Ireland and had a rather nominal, nominal Anglican background. Uh, things were very politicized in Northern Ireland, and there was a lot of tension, of course, between the Protestants and the Catholics. So when he went off to boarding school in England, he pretty much left that behind. Uh, it wasn't an important part of his worldview as a teenager. So part of the reason he's such an effective apologist is because for most of his teens and his 20s, he was an atheist and not just a nominal atheist. He was an outspoken atheist. So when he came back to faith, he really understood the way atheists think and what their problems are with Christianity. Uh, he'd gotten the idea of the dying God myth from James Fraser. There's a famous book called The Golden Bough about all the 
uh, recurring themes in world mythologies. And the concept was that the dying god is very uh, similar to Osiris in Egyptian mythology, Balder in Norse mythology. Uh, if, and uh, Fraser thought it was the, the corn god, the fact that uh, vegetation comes up in the spring and then flourishes in the summer and then withers away in the fall and winter. And he thought that that was a, a symbolic personification of the seasons. And Lewis uh, bought that argument for most of his teens and 20s. He thought Christianity and the idea of Jesus' death and resurrection was just one more dying God myth. And when he met Tolkien, who was a devout Catholic in Oxford in his late 20s, Tolkien said, well, let me reframe that for you. Um, all the other myths are clearly mythological. Nobody looks for the birthplace or the, the where uh, Balder lived or where Osiris lived. But you can go to Jerusalem or you can go to Galilee and you can follow in the footsteps of the historical figure named Jesus. And he said, really, all the other dying God myths were this kind of uh, collective unconscious or an intuition that we need redemption from above. We can't save ourselves. We don't have the, the, the power to redeem ourselves. And so Tolkien said, well, all these dying God myths are simply pointing to the reality of the dying God in history. And uh, Lewis wrote a famous essay called uh, Myth Become Fact, which is, it's the same storyline, but this time it really happened in history. We know which Caesars it happened under. We know uh, who was the, the administrators there in uh, Jerusalem and, and uh, Judea. And so that was really revolutionary for Lewis. He'd been thinking of Jesus as a moral teacher, somewhat like Socrates, who had a lot of good ideas to think about, but eventually was ran afoul of the authorities. But you would never pray to Socrates. He was simply a, a philosopher and a moral teacher. Right. But here Jesus died and came back to life, and he's still with us. And so he suddenly realized the uniqueness of Christianity, and he realized that it didn't really... Um, contradict all other world religions, it really completed them. They had an intuition about redemption, but it, it gave it a historical uh, basis and context. And as you say, he called it the grand miracle. He felt that the miracles of the New Testament, some of them looked back to uh, the miracles of nature. Turning wine into water is something that happens naturally. I mean, excuse me, turning water into wine. Yeah. Uh, the uh, rainfall, waters the grapes and they ferment and they become wine. And so he called those the miracles of the old creation. Jesus was simply doing what God always does, but he was making it much more spectacular. Wow. And then he called the other miracles in the New Testament, the miracles of the new creation, the transfiguration of Christ really uh, anticipates what we will all participate in on the last day. And of course, the resurrection of Christ is the first fruits of all creation. Uh, he is the pioneer. He's the uh, the trailblazer. Uh, George MacDonald called him our captain brother. So Lewis felt that the grand miracle not only explained all of natural theology and history leading up to uh, the life of Jesus, but it also cast its light upon the 2,000 years since the resurrection of Christ. So he was uh, really prescient in realizing that a historical event made a very different kind of religion than moral teachings or looking back to a mythological figure. And I think it was, uh, that was the argument that really made him a Christian. And that was the argument that he used the rest of his life to try to explain Christianity to other people. Uh, you sort of touched, I mean, you sort of like anticipated my next question, which you got into, which is Lewis's concept of myth is much richer and much deeper than many Christians today. When you know the average churchgoer, when they hear the word myth, they think not true. But Lewis right, had a right. much richer and a deeper understanding of myth. Um, so he didn't mean that it wasn't true. He meant that it fulfilled uh, what these other false myths actually uh, sort of hinted at. Is that right. right? Yes, that's correct. Nowadays, people say five myths about dieting, which they mean five falsehoods about dieting. Right. Uh, he thought that myths were stories which really captured the profoundest patterns of human life and human society. And so many myths, he thought they were very uh, profound and um, insightful or perceptive about the human condition, but they weren't historical. Right. And so he called Christianity true myth, that it's really the fountain of all mythology, 
when it's mixed with actual history. So yes, I would say that for him, the myth was not a, uh, a derogatory term. It was a very high term of uh, society's intuitions of the, the deeper truths of our human existence that we don't understand except through story. And the beauty of a story which becomes history uh, was really unique among all the world's religions and all the world's mythologies. That is great. So one of the one of the other benefits of living uh, near Wheaton College and getting getting to go to the Marion Wade Center. You and I had lunch uh, last year right. together, and I, I really appreciated that. So, um, and, but you also get to have access to the bookstore, and there, you guys have used books from about Lewis and on Lewis. And I picked right. this one up last year. I think it was. It's called uh, A Mind Awake. Uh, it's an analogy. Right. Yeah, it's the one uh, c compiled by Clyde Kilby. Right, that's the and same person who founded the uh, C.S. Lewis collection, which became the Wade Center. Yeah, that's yes. a great find on your part. It's a very uh, it's, uh, insightful collection. Yeah, I love that book. Very good book. But the, the quote, and this, uh, what you were just talking about, about the myth and what makes Christianity different. And you could talk about, I mean, I, I know a lot, we have a lot of people on our um, our YouTube channel and Epic Archaeology, people who are atheist or very uh, kind of antagonistic toward toward faith in general and then toward Christianity in particular. And they sort of say, well, you know, Christianity is just borrowing or stealing from other, you know, religions or other myths. Right. And, uh, but I found this really amazing quote here that I had never seen before. And it's actually, um, Lewis actually wrote a lot of letters, as you know, and uh, better than anyone, because you're, you're there directing the Way Center. But um, this is a, uh, a reply to, to a Professor Rice at, in the Phoenix Quarterly in autumn of 1946. And um, as an archaeologist, I'm interested in uh, the connection between the biblical text, the New Testament, and the archaeological record. And in Christianity, uh, our belief is that it's not just a, uh, a personal thing. We actually believe it's grounded in history. And Lewis, mm -hmm. really, that, that's the essence of, of what makes Christianity different, is that you can actually go and research this. But right. um, he's addressing this idea in this quote here about um, how – that uh, the fact that the, the incarnation is a miracle is not antithetical to doing history. It's just that history, uh, in history, you're dealing with one-time events. So he, let me just read the quote here. You've, I know you know this quote probably, but he says, uh, we cannot, what cannot be trusted to recur is not material for science. And what he means by that is, is what can't be, you know, it's re rep repetitive. History is just a one-time event, like the sinking of the Titanic, you know, just happened one time. So he says, uh, that is why history is not one of the sciences. And, and again, I think he means like chemistry or biology. Right. You cannot find out what Napoleon did at the Battle of Austerlitz or Esterlitz by asking him to come and fight it again in a laboratory with the same combatants, the same terrain, uh, the same weather, and the same age. You have to go to the records. We have not, in fact, proved that science excludes miracles. We have only proved that the question of miracles, like the innumerable other questions, excludes laboratory treatment. Love that right. quote. right. So it's, it's yeah. really good. And uh, in his book, Miracles, uh, again, he, he, he takes to task this idea that miracles are not possible. And uh, again, as you pointed out, David, um, he calls the incarnation the grand miracle. Um, right. And uh, it, it certainly is. But, you know, you and I believe that, and, and you are a believer, and I'm a believer, but there are people who are watching. We have people who watch our podcast, listen to podcasts, who are not believers. And it you know, on the surface, when you when you think about it, because because it is so familiar to us, it may sound crazy to modern ears. Right. But this but this ancient truth uh, is is still relevant today. And Lewis, uh, he he basically took this truth and uh, pondered it, and then eventually came to believe it. Um, so, and you already covered this. I was going to talk about uh, you know Lewis's steps toward conversion, and uh, you did write a book in two thousand two, the most reluctant convert. Um, in fact, didn't Lewis, I think that's actually a line from Lewis himself who called right. himself the most reluctant convert. So um, my next question for you, David, is how would you describe Lewis's incorporation of the main tenets of Christian faith into his own literary world of, of medieval literary criticism and ancient myth? You sort of touched on that a little bit, but um, did he just jump straight into the belief, I mean, that of the incarnation and all the, I mean, just like any Christian, when you, when you come to Christ and you're converted, there's sort of a process of spiritual growth. Um, is there any insights you can give us on to Lewis's sort of uh, journey to, to coming to incorporate these ideas into his thinking as a brilliant uh, literary person? 
if that makes sense. <laughs> uh, yeah, my book, Most Reluctant Convert, is about his spiritual journey. And basically, he tried everything else before Christianity. Uh, Churchill said of the Americans when the, in World War II, is, he says they always come up with the right answer after they've tried all the wrong answers. <laughs> That's right. And in some ways, uh, Lewis was the same way. Uh, as a teenager, he uh, lost confidence in his uh, childhood faith. Partly his mother died when he was only nine years old. And it gave him a sense that how could a benevolent God take away someone's mother? So emotionally, uh, these kind of journeys are always uh, emotional and spiritual as well as intellectual. So he tried materialism. He tried the idea that there is uh, nothing here but the physical universe and we are some kind of a uh, freaks of the cosmos that we're even here and we're self-conscious. He has a beautiful, the beginning of problem of pain, he makes the case for atheism and it's quite a powerful case. You can under, you can see that he knew atheism from the inside, but eventually he said, <clears throat> if we feel that the universe is unjust and um, that God is indifferent, where did we get that standard? Where do, where do we know where justice comes from, where goodness comes from? Why do we yearn for fairness and equity and uh, justice? And he finally decided that if there was no God or an indifferent God, we wouldn't know it. We would be like fish in water who are not aware of the water. And so he thought the very fact we have an internal standard of good and evil suggested that we have eternity in our hearts. So he tried materialism, he couldn't live with it. For a while he got very interested in occultism. And uh, at the turn of the century, there was a loss of confidence in traditional faith. And so people were trying to a more scientific approach uh, to psychic uh, events and seances and, and what they considered to be a more scientific approach to spirituality. But he eventually, his uh, uh, adopted mother's brother got very into occultism and had a nervous breakdown and felt mm -hmm. that he was being dragged to hell by demons and died in his 40s. Wow. And Lewis felt suddenly there are spiritual realities out there and we need to be careful not to approach them from the wrong direction. Even before he was a Christian, he started talking about the enemy in his letters with a capital E, meaning there's some kind of a dark spiritual force which is haunting human beings. Um, in his 20s, he got very interested in philosophical idealism, almost like Hinduism, the idea that we are all a part of God and we have the spark of divinity within us. And somehow we need to uh, unite in, with the, uh, the cosmic spirit. But eventually he realized that that's a very, con that's a very um, convenient religion because it doesn't make any demands on you morally or personally. It's just sort of this comfort. It's almost like the idea of the force be with you yeah. in the Star Wars movies. And so he tried about everything else. He also felt that if there is a spirit in the universe, is, does it have consciousness? And if it has consciousness, does it have a sense of right and wrong? So we can't simply talk about the force and the dark side of the force until we decide whether the spirit uh, is conscious and has moral values. So he literally tried straight materialism. There's nothing but the physical world. He tried occultism. He tried idealism and he decided ultimately that pantheism, he called it the oldest guess of humanity. The idea that everything in the cosmos has consciousness, trees and rocks and uh, stars. And so he came to Christianity after pretty much looking at all the alternatives which made him a much more effective Christian apologist. Because when people challenged him, he'd heard it before and he'd yeah. thought it before. Right. Uh, so he was very eloquent when it came to conversations with those kinds of unbelievers. Uh, in, in his search um, and his trying the different things like idealism, um, I know that he does write a little bit about Taoism, and is that is that where he right. sort of explores? Was he, was he ever enamored? I know I think I've read somewhere where he was sort of enamored with Buddhism, Eastern mysticism, that kind of thing. Uh, well, he in one essay he says the two great choices are Hinduism or Christianity, hmm. and he says that Buddhism is actually a development from Hinduism to give it more explicit ethical framework, and even Islam is a development from Christianity. Um, so I don't know if I would say enamored. I would say he, he really appreciated the Buddha's moral teachings, which are the reason we have so much suffering is because we have desire and we need to yeah. cut back on desire. But in, in many ways, that is a Eastern version of stoicism, that if you learn not to expect much from life, then you will be happy. Um, he did talk about Taoism 
not as a uh, philosophy of the cosmos, but as an understanding that all morality, there's this very uh, densely woven fabric of right and wrong values. Yeah. And if you take one thread, such as love of kindred or love of country, it becomes really uh, a uh, kind of gross exaggeration of one trait in terms of other moral traits. You see this in someone like Hitler. He loved Germany and he wanted to support Germany, but he suddenly it became Germany to the exclusion of all other countries. Yeah. So what had been kind of a positive value of restoring the morale of his nation turned into a very nihilistic value. So Lewis loved the idea of Taoism, that there are moral universals that you can't shake off. And it's this tapestry of different values of good and evil. He talks about this in Abolition of Man. Yeah. And he does a great job of explaining that there, the old idea that morality is very arbitrary and different cultures have different standards. He says that's grossly exaggerated. Actually, most cultures have very similar values to the Ten Commandments. And that's what he calls Taoism, T-A-O-I-S-M. Yeah, I remember the first, um, the very first philosophy class I ever had, um, I have a minor in philosophy actually, actually I have a master's degree in philosophy, but my bachelor's degree was in anthropology and philosophy and religion. And uh, the very first philosophy class I had was actually at a community college and the professor, for whatever reason, used a book called The Tao is Silent. And oh, wow. I absolutely hated the class. Hate, I thought, if this is what philosophy is like, I want no part of it. <laughs> right, right. Because I didn't, I, I was in my untrained mind, I just, it doesn't, didn't make any sense. But that's the point of Taoism is that it's more experiential. It's not, you know, using rational categories. It's more the Tao is silent. Well, the Tao is everything. The Tao is nothing. Like, well, then what? That doesn't make any sense right. to me, you know. It was right by, I think the, the, the author of the book was the, uh, Raymond Smolian. But uh, now I, I think I understand what they're trying to get at, but I just think it's false um, as, a, as a system. But Lewis, as you said, uh, he tried everything. And he's sort of like, uh, what, what continues to amaze me about Lewis is how absolutely modern and relevant he is right, to right. people today who are searching. And, you know, David, you know, we, I mean, in the past several months this year, we've been living through an unprecedented time in our country and not only America, but also the world. And a lot of people are searching. They're looking for meaning. Would you, uh, if you were going to talk to someone out there who perhaps is watching this right now, who, who is sort of dabbling and thinking about Christianity and faith, um, is there any book from Lewis that you'd recommend that, uh, on his journey to, toward contemplating coming to Christ? Well, uh, he, I think the, the, the classic of Lewis is Mere Christianity, which started yep. out as broadcast talk during World War II. He was asked to give four talks, and they were so influential, they asked him to do a fifth talk to answer questions. And then that series was uh, so popular, they asked him to come back a second time, and then a third time, and then a fourth time. Yeah. And those four series of talks became mere Christianity. And it really covers uh, why we're Christians in the first place. Uh, once again, the idea that there is this sense of right and wrong built within us, which even when we deny it's it's even, we know it's true, but we ourselves fall short of that. Um, then he talks about Christian ethics, then he talks about Christian theology. Uh, and it's really a great overview of Christian faith for people who need something more substantial. Often we get things in churches or on the media, which is so superficial yes. that we feel like, really, that's what Christians believe or that's what they stand for. Exactly. And Lewis, I was just reading screw tape letters and he has this passage where Screwtape is the senior tempter who's trying to uh, explain to a junior devil how to uh, uh, get uh, people to falter in their spiritual journey, especially Christians. And he has this passage on, uh, try start mixing someone's faith with their political opinions and make their politics a part of their faith and then make it the most important part of their faith. And before you know it, meetings and pamphlets and uh, protest will become the most important part of their faith, and faith, love, and hope will become in the background. Wow. And he wrote that 80 years ago, and I was just thinking how incredibly relevant that is to the contemporary situation. Yeah, I would tend to say uh, the, the screw tape letters hold up very well. Mere Christianity holds up very well. 
in many ways, the Narnia Chronicles communicate Christian values in a way that is uh, very easy to enjoy the stories for children and also for adults, but also to get the basics of Christian uh, theology. Uh, Lewis once said that uh, once upon a time is normally a better way to get through to people than thou shalt not. And I think his once upon a time imaginative exploration of Christianity may actually draw people in more than his uh, nonfiction works. Absolutely. I, I could not agree more with that. And uh, I was just about to go into the wardrobe uh, with uh-huh. your book. And that's a great segue to talk about this. I have, um, I've got the, the, a, re, a re-edition of the old set with the great right. illustrations, uh, you know, and so I want to sort of, let's now sort of transition now and go into the wardrobe and talk about um, Lewis's um, sort of his, I, I guess, the, here's the, how I'd like to sort of uh, bring us into this. And this is something that, well, first, let me, let me ask you a quick question about, uh, you mentioned uh, Mere Christianity and the fact that it was a series of BBC talks. I, I don't know where I read this. And David, clear this up for me, because if there's anybody that would know the answer to this, it would be you. Um, but uh, I had heard or read somewhere where, was it Winston Churchill who asked him to do this? Or, or am I reading that wrong? To, initially asked Lewis to do the BBC broadcast. No, he uh, later on Churchill offered a medal after the war. He offered a medal to Lewis oh. uh, for his for the mere Christianity and his other things that he'd done to support British morale. Uh, Lewis didn't accept the medal because he felt that people would think, "Oh, Christianity must be tied to Churchill or Toryism," and he didn't want people to mix in their minds the eternal faith with. Uh, contemporary political parties. I love it. So Churchill did honor Lewis after the war, but the original request came from the BBC. Okay. Um, They had a religious channel or religious services, so it came from James Welch at the BBC. Okay, that's, that, that was it. And maybe it was the reading, the more I learn about Lewis and and all the little small backstories and the the letters that I read from him, the more I just love him. And and, right, right. People always ask you to, uh, he was very earnest. Most people would think that writing books would be enough in terms of read my book and that will help you with your Christian faith. But also during the war, <clears throat> when the war started, uh, he was asked to go to RAF bases and try to give talks to uh, help the morale of RAF personnel, the pilots and the mechanics and everybody else who was involved. And he went all over England during the war, all the way up to Scotland and Wales and Northern England, giving these talks. And he actually wasn't that good at it because he was a professor and he didn't understand where common people were coming from. Um, In one talk, he was talking about Pauline soteriology, (laughs) yawning and looking at their watches. And he suddenly realized that he was way over their heads. So he said, you know, I believe that many prostitutes and pawnbrokers will be closer to the throne of God in heaven than many churchgoers. And they all suddenly said, wait, what did you say? Um, so he learned how to get people's attention and to get on their wavelength. And it's, a, it's an interesting parable for all of us because basically he was a failure as an RAF speaker, but he learned what he needed to learn when it came time to do the BBC talks, which became mere Christianity. So he was someone who learned from his failures and that really helped him be a much more effective uh, apologist for Christianity in later years. I think that's something we should all recall. Absolutely. I can could not agree more. Absolutely. In fact, one of the things that I personally, among just reading Mere Christianity and me, reading all of his great books and essays and things like that, is the fact that as, an, as uh, I'm an archaeologist, but I'm also an apologist as well, I'm, I have a master's degree in apologetics, is um, one of the biggest challenges that I think that apologists have today is what I call the translation issue. It's translating these great truths to mm-hmm. Christian faith in a way that they can be understood. And Lewis learn that just like anybody else. And he translated these things into a language that people can understand. So, so one of the ways he does that, and you touched on it earlier, and that is in, in uh, the Chronicles of Narnia series. So there's so many things that we could talk about, but I, I did list, uh, write down a few things that I want to sort of, as we talk about the Chronicles of Narnia, which is, which made into a movie. And David, did you, uh, real quickly, did you have any uh, insight or any kind of, um, uh, part to play in the creation of the movies, the most recent movies are made by that? 
Um, I didn't. There's a, I'm a, uh, a good friend of Doug Gresham, who's Lewis's stepson. Yes. And he was very involved in the movies. He actually went to New Zealand and worked on the filming. And he has a cameo role in each of the films. Uh, one of them, he's the voice on the radio they listen to and other places. It's kind of like Hitchcock, who loved to do cameos in his own films. Um, I have been in uh, contact with Doug Gresham about, it's now going to be a Netflix series. Oh. And Netflix invested a huge amount of money in redoing the Narnia Chronicles. And I'm glad because when you do a series, you can go into more detail. Yes. Trying to cram the entire book into a two-hour movie wasn't entirely successful for the theatrical releases. So I'm very excited about uh, their coming out on Netflix. Part of the reason I wrote that book on Narnia, which I called Into the Wardrobe, was because there was so much interest brought about by the movies. And so I was trying to give people insights into, they're, they're surprisingly, um, uh, they seem simple, but they're surprisingly complex. He gets in a lot of theology, apologetics, a lot of literary allusions. Uh, in Silver Chair, where they have a parliament of owls, that's a joke on a, a Chaucer story called the Parliament of Fowls. So there's all kinds of literary allusions. As an adult, you can really enjoy his uh, puddle glums. Also in Silver Chair is the, the frog-like creature who guides them on their journey in the Silver Chair. He, uh, in his history of English literature, he was talking about a very minor poet who wasn't very good. And he called the River Styx a puddle glum. The River Styx is this river of fire that separates earth from hell. And this poet called it a puddle glum. And Lewis thought that was hilarious. That it was such an inappropriate description. But he remembered the phrase, and then that becomes a character in the Narnia Chronicles. <laughs> so it's really fun to read them, not just at the child's level of the plot and the adventure and learning to love Aslan, but also there's the professor and the, uh, the philosopher in the background there that you're hardly even noticing because you're enjoying the story so much. That's right. Um, love that. So let's begin with a couple of things here I wrote down just so I wanted to sort of uh, get your uh, thoughts about, and that is, um, first of all, it is, it is uh, children that enter Narnia, and that just <laughs> To me, reminds me of the passage where Jesus in, in, the, in the New Testament, where he says, unless you become like a little child, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Does Lewis, is he intentionally drawing on that concept of entering into this world through the eyes of a child? And is there anything that we can learn from that today? Uh, I think he did. In many ways, Narnia is his emotional excursion to his own childhood. He felt that he had a wonderful, ideal childhood before his mother died when he was nine. Hmm. And... Narnia, the characters, some ways, they're more turn of the century. They're Edwardian children, their slang and their style of dress. So I think he's thinking back to his own childhood uh, when he writes the Narnia Chronicles. He did feel that um, adults have a lot of defense mechanism against faith or against a new philosophy or new ideas in general. And he said, I wondered if I could write stories which uh, steal past those watchful dragons of Sunday school memories and stained glass windows and, and rote services. So he did feel that using the imagination and the mind of a child, you could get past some of the defense mechanisms that people have against Christianity. I'm sure as an apologist, you, uh, you notice how often the objections to Christianity, they're surprisingly flimsy. Yeah. You're, uh, you're bracing yourself for this really philosophically sophisticated argument, and you're really ready, and then they'll say something like, well, we don't even know if there was a historical Jesus. Maybe this person never existed. That's right. And you go, uh, that's, that's a pretty superficial uh, reason to not be a Christian. Exactly. So I think Lewis felt like he wanted to get around all those kind of adult objections and get back to the mind of a child. I think you're, you're exactly right. That's, that's awesome. That is fantastic. Um, and as you said, it's much more nuanced and complex than the people, you know, really uh, realize that this is, even though it is sort of a children's book, it's also very adult as well. And in literary, uh, you know, contains these incredible literary illusions, historical illusions, things like that. Um, but one of the phrases that I wanted to ask you about, David, is um, in the very beginning part where, where Lucy meets Mr. Tumnus, and um, of course, you know, he tries to sort of get her and then he, he feels bad about it. And he, he makes this phrase, he says, it's always winter and never Christmas. So 
what does it, what does that mean? How, you know, for those who have never read the book, what, or maybe if you have, if they have read the book, um, is there a, is there an explanation for that statement? And what, what's the theological meaning of that? Always winter, never Christmas. Uh, well, I think going back to your idea of the incarnation, uh, when the white witch took over uh, the Narnia, it, it was never spring. It was always cold. It was always snowy. Uh, but there's nothing to look forward to. I think we all feel like, well, winter is kind of a dreary time with the short days and the cold. But Christmas is obviously the, the uh, one of the biggest holidays of the year. Uh, and he intended, he really wanted to bring back the wonder of the incarnation to this world, which o only was dominated by the white witch and coldness and short days. And the idea that Aslan is coming back, Aslan is going to change things. Uh, a little girl wrote and said, in the Voids of Dawn Twitter, Aslan says, well, I'm, I'm in your world as well. I just have a different name. Yeah. And uh, the little girl wasn't sure what he meant and said, well, what is Aslan's name in our world? And uh, Lewis wrote her a charming letter and said, well, think about it. Uh, who is it that came right around the middle of winter at Christmas and who's associated with Father Christmas coming and giving gifts? And he gave a number of clues that we're supposed to recognize that Aslan's coming in the middle of winter is the same as uh, the incarnation at Christmas. He does the same thing in the last battle. When they all go into a stable, which from the outside, it looks like this dingy little stable where they're all going to be imprisoned but it turns out to be a portal to the new narnia it turns out to be a portal to eternity and and uh, uh, endless blessedness and they all say it's so strange how the stable is so much bigger on the inside than it was on the outside wow so he really wants to remind you through fiction and through imagination of the miracle of the incarnation and the miracle that happened in that little stable right in the middle of winter that is fantastic. I love that. Uh, it, and, and as you said, it's just, um, you know, I think we've lost, to, I think to, even today, modern Christians uh, have lost the sense of the mystery and the awe of the incarnation. And I'll just confess, this is a personal thing for me. Um, you know, there are a lot of uh, truths of the Christian faith that people just find amazing. But the one that to this day, I still just find truly astounding is the incarnation and the fact that right. God became flesh. And um, how do, I mean, I know this, this is sort of a, a I guess, a opinion question for you. Uh, how do Christians today get this wonder, this mystery back that, uh, that we've lost? And, and it, it, is there something that's lost and not having the mystery? I mean, are we, are we selling ourselves short by making it too cerebral? Um, I think, I think, especially in apologists and thinkers and philosophers, you know, we over cerebralize things, if I can use that word. Right. Yeah. Right. But we, is there a way to bring back this mystery? Have we, do you think we've lost it as well? No, I agree. I mean, everything uh, has become rather stale by rep uh, right, repetition. In my book, Into the Region of Awe, uh, I talk about Lewis's interest in mysticism. And he didn't want to just depend upon logic and rational argument. He really wanted to cultivate a sense of the presence of God in his personal life. And he was very earnest in his prayer life. Uh, he had a long list of people that he was praying for to become Christians. He had a long list of people that he was praying with thanks that they had become Christians. Um, so I think, and partly that has to do with imagination. Uh, sometimes when you read The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, you remember all, all over again the miracle of the Incarnation. Mm. It's too bad in a way. Chesterton said that if the Bible had not been known in England and suddenly washed up on shore and somebody read this book, they would say, this is the most amazing book in human history. I mean, I just can't believe its spiritual depth and profundity and how much this changes. But he says the fact that we already have the Bible and we read it every Sunday, we lose the sense of mystery and miracle. So I often think that does go back to imagination. I think sometimes you have to enter into the mind of a child to yes. uh, really understand the miracle of God being born as a baby in Bethlehem. Uh, sometimes I think the old Christmas pageants speak more to my heart and my faith than a lot of theology does. Amen. That's right. Yeah, I, that's so, so good and so insightful. Um, the repetition, the fact that we do it, you know, and... We, we read the scripture, it's so familiar to us, and the story is familiar to us, but 
uh, to really to take the eyes of a child and look at it through the eyes of a child, I think is a good thing. And perhaps even perhaps you could get the, this little booklet uh, we talked about earlier, uh, The Grand Miracle at the Weight Center, or even read Lewis yourself. You could go to read, right. you know, read the, the Chronicles of Narnia and, and recapture that and look at, look at the Christmas story, look at the Advent story, the incarnation with new, fresh eyes. Um, so we, we have a few minutes left, David, and um, I want to sort of touch on something. You Well, first of all, just a quick, a quick question for you. And that is, uh, I was in Turkey last year um, doing uh, some groundwork for an archaeological project I'm working on. And I was in, I was in Istanbul. And um, I was, uh, of course, it's an amazing place. But uh, I was, uh, Istanbul has all these little nooks and crannies historically, little shops and tea shops, things like that. And of course, there is um, a Turkish delight in Lewis's books. And then I noticed a couple of stores in Istanbul were called Aslan. And then I discovered that's the Turkish word for lion. Is that right? Right. So my question is, yeah. did Lewis, did he ever visit Turkey? And what's the connection between the Turkish ideas and Lewis? Well, he wasn't very well traveled. He ran across the name Aslan in uh, A Thousand and One Nights. There's a famous oh. English translation from the 19th century. And Aslan is a man, but the name does mean lion. So he got that name from A Thousand and One Nights. You can really see uh, the influence of that book in The Horse and His Boy, uh, the kind of demon figures and riding horses through the desert and being chased by lions. Uh, many of the incidents in Horse and His Boy come from the Arabian Nights. So that's where he got it. Uh, he didn't, uh, it wasn't that well traveled other than going to France for the war. And then late in life, he visited Greece uh, with his wife, Joy Davidman. But in general, he was sort of a stay at home type person. Wow, I never knew that. So, Thousand and One Nights, that's where it came from. Yeah. yeah. That is, who is the author of that book? I should know this. Uh, well, it's a collection going back to, um, it's, it's kind of like the Iliad and the Odyssey. There's no specific author. Okay. I think the translator that he was reading was named Edward Thompson. It was a famous 19th century edition. Uh, and we have the book, His Thousand and One Nights at the Wait Center. We have Lewis's library. And it's fascinating to look up his underlinings. I was just reading one recently where the person says, this is not a matter of scientific fact. It's a matter of mere mysticism. And there's a note from Lewis in the margin that says, this man is a fool. Mysticism <laughs> is a genuine experience of God in your life. But I went and looked up the thousand and one nights and the first mention of a character named Aslan. I was so hoping for underlining or an exclamation point and there's nothing on the page. Oh, wow. <laughs> he absorbed the name in his mind without writing anything on the page. <laughs> Some brilliant insight you thought you were going to get, and it just underlined. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's actually fascinating to look at his underlining and try to figure out why something stuck in his mind. Uh, sometimes he writes extensive notes of the books, but other times he just has a bracket or an underline, and you're trying to figure out why that got his attention. So it's fascinating to try to... Uh, get into the mind of Lewis and figure out why something uh, was important to him as he was reading. Uh, it, some books that he didn't like, uh, he read uh, uh, Byron's Don Juan, the poet Don Juan, which is very sat satirical and cynical. It's not at all to Lewis's taste. There's not a single mark in the entire book until you get to the back cover, and then it says, never again. <laughs> only comment on the whole book. That's great. <laughs> never again. I love it. Well, I, I guess I'm going to come because sometimes I'll read, I, I read a lot of books by atheists and skeptics and agnostics, and I will actually write and interact with the book. So I, right, I, right. I feel like I'm in good, good company. Lewis is doing it too. So yeah, he did. He did. He actually had a whole index. A lot of his books, he wrote an index in the back, a concept that he thought was important. He would start, uh, you know, put that concept in the back cover and he would put eight or 10 or 12 page numbers to that particular concept. So he was a very engaged reader. He was not a casual reader. That is great. That's something I, that I was actually mentored by uh, back in seminary. I was his graduate assistant for about a year and a half, Dr. Norman Geisler, who, oh, uh, right, yeah. and Dr. Geisler actually taught me that years ago. Uh, he said that's something he does, and he, he encouraged me to do it when I'm reading in the back of the book to actually get the quote, write the number down so you can have a quick reference so you can actually right. find it. So, right. so Lewis apparently did that first. And maybe, maybe guys should learn from Lewis. I don't know. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I think most engaged readers do that. One time when we were, Chris and I were in Santa Barbara, um, we had to evacuate because there was a fire coming near our home. This was about 20 years ago. And I was grabbing uh, our legal documents and our photo albums 
and Crystal was putting all these books in a box. And I said, well, Crystal, that's not essential. Let's grab the, the important stuff. She said, but these have all my underlinings. <laughs> they had to give up these books because they have all my, so yeah, she was right. So we loaded up her, uh, her books along with our uh, legal documents and photo albums. I'm with Crystal on that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. We're going to finish up with something. We'll we're just for the, the last few minutes, a couple of minutes that we have. Uh, it's an essay that I I'm, I'm still learning as, as as you know, David. Uh, and man, we could just spend another several hours talking about Lewis and all the wonderful insights that he has into our faith. But um, one of the things that I have, and I'm a, a lifelong student of Lewis. But one of the things I learned recently, in the past, I would say three or four years, I came across. Um, a book, I guess it's a book, um, it's published in, published in 1959, The World's Last Night and Other Essays, okay, right. originally published in 1952 as The Christian Hope and Its Meaning for Today in Religion and Life, which appeared in 1952. But um, since we're talking about the incarnation and the fact that Christ came to this earth 2,000 years ago, I thought it might be appropriate to talk about um, the fact that we are sort of living in this winter period, even though Christ has come historically, but there's also going to be a second coming. Now, Christians disagree, and there's a lot of debate about eschatology and end-time prophecy, and I'm not going to get into that, but all Christians around the world, a core tenet of the Christian faith is that Christ will return. He will physically return. So we may disagree about some of the finer points of eschatology, but we all agree that Jesus will return, that that's really going to happen. And Lewis, I, I was surprised, talked about this, and what he says about it, it's just mic drop. I mean, just truly remarkable. Um, so I want to read a, a, a couple lines from this and then get your uh, take on this. And to really kind of lead on, leave on a positive note that although we do live in this world that sort of is in, in a winter period, Christ will come again, and, and history is going to end, and the king, will re Aslan, is on the move. And the king is going to return. But Lewis, um, just a couple of lines here. He says, um, he says this, the doctrine of the second coming is deeply less congenial to the whole evolutionary or developmental character of modern thought. We have been taught to think of the world as something that grows slowly toward perfection, something that progresses or evolves. He says, Christian apocalyptic offers us no such hope. It does not even foretell, which would be much more tolerable to our habits of thought, a gradual decay. It foretells a sudden, violent end imposed from without, an extinguisher popped onto the candle, a brick flung at the gramophone, a curtain rung down at the play or on the play, halt. He says the doctrine of the second coming teaches us that we do not and cannot know when the world drama will end. The curtain may be rung down at any moment, say, before you have finished reading this paragraph. There seems to be some people, this seems to some people intolerably frustrating. So many things would be interrupted. Perhaps you were going to get married next month. Perhaps you're going to get a raise next week. You may be on the verge of a great scientific discovery. You may be uh, maturing great social and political f reforms. Surely no good and wise God would be so very unreasonable as to cut all of this short. Not now of all moments. He says, but we think thus because we keep on assuming that we know the play. We do not know the play. We do not know whether we are in act one or act five. We do not know who the major and all the minor actors are. The, the author knows the audience. If there is an audience, if angels and archangels and all the company of heaven fill the pit and the stalls may have an inkling, but we never seeing the play from the outside, never meeting any characters except the tiny minority who are on in the same scenes as ourselves, wholly ignorant of the future and very imperfectly informed about the past, cannot tell at what moment the end ought to come. That will come when it ought. We may be sure, but we waste our time in guessing what time that will be. That it has meaning, we may be sure, but we cannot see it. When it is over, we may be told. We are led to expect that the author will have something to say to each of us on the part that each of us has played. The playing it well is what matters infinitely. Love mm. that. It's mm. truly remarkable. I'm sorry yeah, for great such a long quote, but uh, I know you're familiar with that. But right. Any thoughts on the auth uh, on that on that essay and what Lewis where where was he thinking? Did how did that essay come up and and was he uh, addressing a, a person who asked him about this or did he, did he have thoughts about it himself? Apparently he did. Well, he had a very vivid spiritual imagination. You see this again in the last battle uh, that he 
his uh, literary executor, Walter Hooper, said he never met somebody for whom the natural and the supernatural were so blended. Most of us have our regular life and our religious life. And he said, Lewis wasn't that way. He said, every day and every conversation, the spiritual and the natural were, were uh, interwoven in his conversation. So he had a very vivid sense of the second coming. Uh, and he often, interestingly, he didn't use biblical imagery for heaven. At the end of Great Divorce, the, all these people from hell are take a bus to the outskirts of heaven and it's foothills leading to even greater mountains. Wow. And at the end of Letters to Malcolm, uh, heaven is seen as waking up on this beautiful morning in nature and seeing all these familiar faces. Wow. Uh, and so he didn't like what's called historicism, which is theories of history, like Marxism, that uh, this class is fighting this class, and at some point they will reach a, a synthesis or a unity. He, mm -hmm. he didn't see any uh, historical theories really fitting the pattern of history. So he, he wrote a, uh, an essay called On Historicism, and he says, if we knew every fact of every moment in history, we might be able to come up with a theory of where history is headed. But he said, yes, and if the sky should fall, we can all catch larks. Uh, it's not going to happen. So basically, his idea of the apocalypse was we don't know, as you said, if we're in Act 1, is this, are we having so much trouble on Earth because we're so immature and we're going to evolve? Are we in a decadent stage that we've gone past the golden age? And he said, it's really impossible to know, which throws you back on the life of faith, especially per personal faith. Uh, and so I would pair that with the last battle, the idea that you can't see a narrative to history or you can't see a storyline. You just have to be faithful and ready for when that time comes, you are prepared. He had a fascinating experience in the last few months of his life. He went into a coma for a while in the summer before he died in 1963. And Walter Hooper was sitting at his hospital bed and uh, Lewis sat up in bed and was just looking off into space. And he said, I never imagined, I never imagined. Wow. And uh, Hooper had this sense that he said, uh, what he saw gave him a great refreshment of the spirit. But then he lay back down and forgot about it. And later Hooper asked him about this incident and Lewis didn't remember anything about it. Hmm. But it was very fitting for Lewis that he had such a vivid spiritual imagination. He almost literally felt like he was seeing over to the other side in the last few months before he died. That's part of what makes his writing so powerful is you, it really gets you imaginatively engaged with Christian truths rather than just intellectually uh, turning them over in your mind. Absolutely. I had never heard that story before about, about the, you know, toward the end of his life, he had that vision. It sort of um, reminds me of a story of Aqu uh, Thomas Aquinas, the great medieval theologian, right. who, uh, and I don't know that the story, there's uh, different people say different things, but, you know, he wrote the great Summa Theologia, which is, which is the most grand theology in the Middle Ages, and then toward the end of his life, he said um, he had this sort of vision in his, towards his death, and he says, everything that I've written is a straw. Right, and, and right. So, uh, Lewis sounds like he had sort of a similar thing because he, he wrote very eloquently on, you know, this longing and, and meditation in the tool shed. He gets into looking along versus looking at. And that right. was a brilliant insight into you can study something from the outside, but unless you're in it, you see it from a different perspective and looking along the beam and looking in the beam, seeing outside right. the door. Yeah, that, that's a great essay. He actually mentioned that, that uh, episode in Thomas Aquinas's life in Letters to Malcolm, chiefly on prayer. Oh, wow. Uh, he really prized the idea that you could spend your whole life in intellectual inquiry, and then one glimpse of God himself or of supernatural realities would make all of that seem like straw. Yeah, that, that's a great episode that Lewis himself cherished. Wow. Well, as I knew it would, our time has flown by, and um, I cannot thank you enough, David, for, for coming on Monocle and Spade. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thank you, Ted. Really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you so much. And thank you, those of you who are watching, those of you who support Epic Archaeology, thank you so very much. And thank you for watching Monocle and Spade. 
the podcast of Epic Archaeology. If you are not already a subscriber, please hit subscribe and subscribe on our YouTube channel. Give us a like, give us a thumbs up. Uh, please comment if you have any comments on this. But uh, let me say on behalf of Epic Archaeology, myself, and those who help me out uh, with Defenders Media, we want to wish you and yours a very Merry Christmas this year. And uh, thank you so much again for your prayers and your support. And we hope you guys have a wonderful Advent season. God bless and take care. Right.